Over the years, I've heard several different analogies to help better understand the concept of IPv4 layer 3 routing, but some of them fall a little bit short of the mark. So I want to share with you an analogy that I've created that's going to help you understand the big picture regarding IP routing in general. And it all starts with a building. So let's imagine we have a giant building and everything that happens is going to happen inside of this building. Inside of this building, there's lots of different offices and hallways that connect offices together. So let's go ahead and draw a little hall right here. Now, halls are interesting because we can go through them and we can have doors. For example, we could have a door right here at this end and a door over here. And if we had offices off to the side, we'd have doors that lead to those offices as well. So a hall is a pathway from one part of the building to the other. And let's also give these halls some numbers because we're going to draw a few of them. So this would be hall number 10. And let's draw in another hall here. So we'll put some doors on the end. And we can put doors on the sides too for other offices and so forth. I'm just going to put one door at each end of the hall. And let's call this one hall number 12. So if we design the building, we can actually decide on what we're going to number these halls. And let's create a skinny little hall from here to here. That's going to be hall 13. And how about another hall right here? Let's call that hall 23. And I'll put little doors at each end there. I'll also label those so we know what they are. And just for grins, let's draw a few more halls in with doors at each end. How about one more hall over here? And for this hall, let's call it hall 20. And actually, let's put another one here. We'll call this hall hall 30. And over here, let's call this hall 34. Again, with doors at each end. And if we need more doors, you know, in the middle of the hall to go to other offices, we can add more doors as well. And then because I don't want to draw every single possible hall inside of this building, I'm going to go ahead and just represent the rest of the halls and the rest of the building with a little cloud saying, hey, there's more halls and stuff off this direction. So let's imagine we have a person who's at the end of this hall. Maybe it's a customer of the company. Maybe it's a polite customer. So here we have this really polite customer. And let's also imagine that they are at point A here in the building. And let's imagine they want to deliver a package that they have. And they want this package delivered from point A to point B in the building. So let's focus our attention right here on this polite customer with this package. The customer, they do not, I repeat, they do not know all the details about our hallways and passageways inside of our building. So this customer, they may label their package for the delivery, you know, coming from A, going to B, but they are not going to be walking it all the way themselves. Instead, they're going to go ahead and get some help from employees in the building. So let's imagine there's an office here and there's a person who's in that office and that office is connected to hall number 10. So there's our person, there's their arms, and we'll call this person, person number one. Now, person number one may also not know the entire building, but person number one is directly connected here to hallway 10 and hallway 12 and hallway 13. So if we need to get this package all the way from point A to point B, this customer can simply hand it to this person, person number one, and then it's really up to person number one here to you know, somehow forward that package towards the direction it needs to go. And let's also imagine that person one can't move, meaning they're basically sitting in their office that's connected to hall 10 and hall 12 and hall 13. So let's draw a few more employees at the company. Let's go ahead and put a person here and that'll be person number two. And let's say person two, their office is connected to hallway 12 and hallway 20 and hallway 23. And they're kind of stuck right there with those three hallways. So let's go ahead and draw yet another employee at the company. And then play number three, because their office is directly connected to these three halls, that employee knows how to get to, you know, hall 23, hall 13, and hall 34. And just for granted, let's imagine that the destination B here is right here in an office off this hall 34. So that, my friend, is the target or where we want that package to be delivered. So getting back to this package up here, the polite customer could say, OK, this is coming from me at point A in hall 10, and I need the package to be delivered over here to hall 34 to person B. So again, focused here at the package with the polite customer, here's what could happen. The customer could go ahead and take this package and say, you know what? I don't know the whole deal about how to get this package way over here, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to this employee right here, down this hall. So there's a handoff, effectively, the customer handed the package over to person number one. And here's the kicker. It's really a matter of trust at that point. I mean, how does the polite customer know that person one here is going to do the right thing and forward it on to the next person or the next person who can then finally deliver it? The answer is this customer doesn't. It's really just a matter of hope that that will be delivered. So the customer did everything in their power. They addressed it correctly. They handed it off to person number one. And now it's up to this person to forward it. So I'm going to take this package here 
that was in the hands of our polite customer. And we're now putting it down here at employee number one. So now with employee number one with that package, again, it's still a dress coming from A, it needs to go to B. Person number one now needs to hand this off to somebody else so they can continue forwarding it. So we have two choices here with person number one. They could hand it to person two, that is a possibility, or they could hand it to person three. It really is completely up to this person right here and what they decide to do. So let's imagine that person one here decides, you know what, I'm gonna hand this package over to person two and I'm not gonna hand it over to person three. And for now, we'll just identify that that's a decision that person number one here just made. They're gonna forward this package up to person two as opposed to sending it to person number three. So let's continue our game. We'll take the package and it's now gonna be in the possession of our employee number two. So on the packaging, it still shows us coming from A here in hall 10 and it's still going to B, which is over here off of hall 34. So now employee two has a decision. Now you may think, well, there's only one choice for employee number two. It's got to hand it down here to employee number three. Or the employee two could say, you know what? I don't want to send this. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and just put this in the trash. I'm not going to even send it any further. So let's imagine employee two wanting to do the right thing and moving it is going to go ahead and forward it over here to employee number three. So I'll move the package over here into the hands of employee number three. On the label, it still shows it coming from A in Hall 10. It still shows going to B over here in Hall 34. And before we have Employee 3 deliver this package to the final destination because it's right off this hall, I also want to point out that this polite customer, it is way out of their control now as far as how that's being forwarded through our hallways. I also should point out that once Employee 1 here forwards it to Employee 2, it's also out of the hands of Employee 1. And once again, when Employee 2 forwards that over to Employee 3, it's now no longer in control of employee two. So it's an individual package by package delivery system and each person is gonna simply take that package, they're gonna hand it off to the person or entity they think is the right person and hope for the best regarding that being forwarded the rest of the way. So now employee three here who's on the same hall as our destination can go ahead and let that person know, hey, here's a package and deliver it. So just a couple things to keep in mind is that once it's handed off, it's really out of the control at that point of the person who's handing it off. So once we hand off to here and then to here and then to here and then to here, we're just hoping that the next person is going to do the right thing and knows how to do the right thing. If employee two here did not know, for example, that employee three was the correct next best employee to hand it off to, that also could cause a problem because employee two could say, well, I'm not sure who to hand it off to. I'm going to go ahead and simply drop it or throw it in the trash. It's also important to note in this building analogy with the halls that each of these employees by itself has fairly limited information. For example, let's think about this person right here, employee number one. How many hallways do they know how to get to? <laughs> well, they have a door from their office to these three halls, to hall 10, to hall 12, to hall 13. And by default, that's all they're gonna know about unless they get a map or some other information. And if we look at employee number two here, from its own personal position in the building, it knows about hall 20 because it has a door that goes right to it. It knows about hall 12, it knows about hall 23. But once again, without additional information somehow, it's not gonna know about other hallways like hallway 30 or hallway 34 because it's not directly connected to those halls. And again, the same thing here with this employee number three. It knows about hall 13 and hall 23 and hall 34, but it doesn't know, for example, about hall 10 or hall 12 directly because it's not directly connected there. Meaning its office doesn't have a door that goes directly to those hallways. So in order for that package from this polite customer to be delivered correctly all the way through the building, being handed off from employee to employee to employee, these employees would need information or instructions on how to forward it. So let's imagine we gave employee one instructions that for packages that need to go to the hallway 34, just hand it over to employee two. Now, another example of that would be, what if we need to forward over to hall 30 and devices out here off hall 30? We could also tell employee one here that, hey, to get to hall 30, also forward it here to employee two. Or how about hallway 20? Once again, we could say, you know what, for hallway 20, also forward it to employee two. So now that we've taken a look at this analogy of the building with many hallways and various employees, what does this have to do with static routes and IP routing? And the answer is, this is exactly how IP routing works. So up here, instead of having this polite customer that wants to have a package delivered, this is a PC or a computer connected to a network. These halls really aren't halls, they're just subnets, IP networks. For example, like the 10.10.0 subnet or the 10.20.0 subnet or the 10.13 subnet and so forth. 
These doors at the end of the hall or on the sides of the hall, depending on where they're at, in IPv4 routing, those represent network interface cards on our computers. So in this PC up here, it has a network interface card that connects it to this IP subnet. So each of these hallways represents an IP subnet, as well as behind the scenes, a layer two VLAN where that subnet is being used. As we continue our discovery here with this analogy, for our employees here who took their part in forwarding the package towards the correct destination, instead of calling these employee one, two, and three, these are routers one, two, and three. And routers by themselves aren't that smart. I mean, all they know about as far as IP networks go are what's configured on them. So if we've configured a network interface card that's connected to the 10 subnet and we configure another network interface card that's configured with an IP address associated with the 12 subnet and we configure yet another network interface card that's associated with the 13 subnet, that's all that router knows about as far as how to forward packets to those three networks. It doesn't know anything about the 20 network or 23 or 30 or 34 because those aren't directly connected. And so one of the ways that we can train, for example, router one on how to forward packets over here to subnet 34 is with a static route. And the reason it's called a static route is because we as administrators are going to be configuring these. Think of a static route like instructions. Hey, dear Mr. Employee One, if you have a package that needs to be delivered over here to 34, go ahead and hand it over to router two. That's a specific configuration that we can put on the router. And that's an example of a static route. The route itself would be the information or the instructions on how to forward it to the next device in the path. In this case, router two. Or if we didn't want to hand it over to router two, we could in our static route say, you know what, Mr. Router one, to get to the 34 subnet, go ahead and simply forward it over to router three. Now, which should we use, router two or router three? And that depends on the design and it also depends on how we configured it. So based on our static routes, we can specifically tell this router based on a target given destination who the next hop should be. Should we send it to R2 or should we send it to R3? And when we do that manually, that's known as a static route. Think of it like a static instruction on how to forward in the direction of a remote network. And so from the perspective of router one, everything that it's not directly connected to is a remote network. Subnet 20, subnet 23, subnet 30, subnet 34, and most importantly, the rest of the internet. So here is a physical representation of a Cisco router. Again, they come in multiple sizes, including logical routing functions that are part of a multi-layer switch. So this is an example of a physical router. And let me share with you a topology where we're going to represent that router in a topology diagram. So here are our employees, employee number one, employee number two, employee number three. Here is our polite customer. So if the client PC wants to send a package or send a packet and it needs to forward it to a remote network, it's gonna go ahead and use its default gateway. And that's how the client PC knew who the first device in the path should be, and that is its default gateway. And so because the client PC is forwarding this to its default gateway at layer two, the layer two address in the ethernet frame would be for the default gateway's gig two slash zero interface address. And then the layer two switched environment would forward that at layer two until it arrives at the router. The router would open it up, take a look at the IP header and say, whoa, this packet is destined for. And let's imagine that this right here is a switch between R3 and R4 on this 10.34.0 subnet. And on one of those ports, we have a server and that represents point B where we want to send that traffic. So up here at point A, the source would be 10.10.0 dot and whatever the source address is for client PC. And the destination would be 10.34.0 dot. And let's go ahead and put 100 here for the server. So the client sees the destination network is not local. So it forwards it at layer two to its default gateway. Router one looks at the layer three header and says, oh, this is destined for 10.34 something. So at that point, it needs to make a forwarding decision just like employee one did in the building. So if prior to that, we had configured a static route on router one that said, hey, you know what? You get a packet that needs to be delivered to 10.34 anything. Go ahead and just hand it over here to the next route on the path, router two. And router two's address here would be 10.12.0.2. So when router one sends it, it's gonna send it to the layer two address of router two's gig one slash zero. And now router two looks at the layer three header and says, okay, this is destined for 1034 something. And then as a result, it follows its instructions and it forwards it to the next device in the path. Now, in our case, what we're talking about here for those instructions is a static route. An example of that would be here on router one to say, hey, to get to the 10340 network, forward it over to R2. Or if we wanted to, we could do a static route that says, forward it over to R3. It's all depending on how we want the router to behave. And when we include static routes, what we're really doing is we're building or we're adding into the routing table on that router. 
And one of the critical things about configuring and training a router on how to forward for a specific remote network, we need to have a plan in place so that we know what we intend to have happen. And then we can start putting in the specific instructions at the router so it can follow those instructions. Hey, thanks for watching and subscribe right here to get the latest information from CBT Nuggets. And if you're new to or considering a career in the world of IT, head on over to CBT Nuggets and sign up for a free trial.